As the new bis recording of Mozart's K364 Symphonia Concertante, the Andante movement only, repeats itself endlessly on my stereo, the sound of Richard Tognetti and the ACO Orchestra at their absolutely greatest washes over me like a tsunami. I stare like an idiot at my speech for tonight, wondering how anyone in their right mind would even try to find a verbal equivalent for the volcano like some vast squatting beast rising out of the Mediterranean that I've just spent the last few weeks shooting from a helicopter and trying to turn into the great step pyramid of Zosa, oldest stone building in the world, while my head is also spinning with the staggering beauty of a single gesture made by a woman riding the escalator at the Westfield Doncaster Shopping Centre, and with just how Tognetti's violin sounds like she looked. Well, there you have it. I call it millennial slippage. You might call it madness. But in, my ca but in any case, uh, please explain. I'll do my best. A marble fragment, the head of a satyr, first century Roman, lit from beneath by the glow of hell, sits on a table in my studio. Beneath it, Goya, open at page 437, a bandit stabs a woman. And what about Dostoevsky? Have you looked at the possessed recently? I'm not here today to talk about the downfall of Kevin Rudd or the prospects for some Elizabethan renaissance of the arts if Julia Gillard is elected. I do want to talk about art, though, and the fact that we need a politics that makes the world safe for art. Art itself, of course, can never be entirely safe, either in its origins or as it's experienced, because it's a form of truth, and truth is a wild thing for us to tame. I'm a great enthusiast for the power of blackness in art, and therefore for those two great German language naysayers, Elias Canetti and Thomas Bernhardt. It's Canetti who alerts us to a terrible beauty in this description of a pair of twins hanged at Tyburn in 1776. When the cart was pulled away from under their feet, their hands intertwined. Thus they swung side by side for nearly a minute. Then, when they lost consciousness, their hands slowly came undone from each other. This is an almost random case of the power of art in hearing in the rendition, the overwhelmingly poignant factual rendition of the most dire exaction of the everyday. But it took Canetti to realise the power of representation. I think of Liszt, the man who was dubbed a demon, and the thrill of the diabolism in his music. You can hear it in Michel Campanella's account of Liszt's transcription of Wagner's Lohengrin, the pianist moonwalks through the music, but it's the magic of the music that made the world think that Liszt practised a dark art. Well, they thought Ovid was a magician and he ended up in exile. Think of the audacity with which he begins his great metamorphosis, the tale of transformation. My purpose is to tell of bodies which have been changed into shapes of a different kind. All art leading on from Ovid's epic the trajectory of whose influence would encompass Shakespeare and the great painters of the Renaissance to this fragment, we feel that sense of millennial, slip, millennial slippage, of becoming one with the artistic expression of the past. Art is always a matter of transformation. I'm thinking of Caspar David Friedrich's exquisite little picture, The Evening Star, painted on a small grassy hill outside Dresden, the first city I wanted to, needed to see when I left Australia. I'm thinking of Marta Agarish playing a piano reduction of Rachmaninoff's symphonic dances like a drunkard and in, in full control. Isn't that what the best art is so often like? There's that sense of risk, of license, the sense of teetering on a tightrope, both formally and in terms of what is represented. The two are not separate and then the miracle of control that justifies form and tr transfigures the thing depicted. The sense of the artist as saint or Satan comes from this, doesn't it? And isn't this why we think of the artist as being a bit like a holy fool, persisting in his folly in order to become wise, as Blake says, or seeing his God in the midst of his confusion? Or conversely, selling his soul to the devil, 
for the gift of great creative powers. Behind these romantic myths, there is, there is an acknowledgement of the inordinate nature of art. Anyone who has ever had the sensation of creating art, however humbly, is liable to have had the sensation of having been grabbed by a force from elsewhere. And anyone who experiences the work of a great artist can be tempted by demonology. Oscar Wilde, who believed that you put your genius into your life rather than into your art, created one kind of mythology for this in the picture of Dorian Gray. The man becomes a thing of beauty while the hidden painting becomes the progressive revelation of his evil. And with a wholly different emphasis, shadowed with the spectre of the memory of Nazism, there is Thomas Mann's Dr Faustus, where the composer Adrian Leverkuhn achieves greatness in his art but at the cost of a Faustian bargain. I hasten to add that these mighty mythologies are not guides to the personal lives of the artist. You need only read the biographies of Oscar Wilde or Thomas Mann to be disabused of that kind of nonsense. But they do point to the fact that art can seem like a force of nature that is beyond anyone's control and is therefore always potentially disturbing. It's also incidentally related to the fact that the experience of art overtakes reason. As the wonderful art critic of The New Yorker, Peter Sheldahl says, beauty presents a stone wall to the thinking mind. Beauty makes a case for the sacred and wins that case suddenly and irrationally. That's one reason why criticism in the end can only be testamental. It can point to a thousand features in a work of art, it can analyse the circumstances of its composition and make every kind of illuminating contextual comparison. But in the end, in the decisive matter of judgment, it can only say, wow. But what else can we do in the presence of, say, Parmigianino's drawings, surpassing the draftsmanship of Michelangelo? In fact, I think he leaves him for dead. Or the experience of walking through the Villa Borghese with its Claude Lorraine gardens, Roman traffic in the background, to stand in those rooms and to stare like morons at those sculptures. The dumbfounding experience of looking at what Bernini would make of Ovid's myth of transformation. How in the name of all the gods at once could anyone have carved those sprays of leaves which sprout and fly off the ends of Daphne's fingers from a block of rock? Of course this looks from one direction like the blackest kind of magic, just as, faced the other way, it requires us to awaken a faith that is like a form of spiritual awakening, a passing of the grammar of ascent, because it requires a belief in the impossible. This is the apprehension of the extraordinary mystery that lies behind the diversity of some of the greatest art. You can see the signatures, the scuff marks, the handprints and shifting shadows in a late Titian, but the effect is like nothing on earth. Nothing, of course, stands in greater contradiction to notions of democratic equality, let alone socialism, than the radical inequality that the skills of a Bernini or the Homeric genius of a Titian display. It's not reasonable, it's not proportionate, and it defies all conventions of equal rights. When we look at the zenith of art, we are looking at things which present a comprehensive panorama of the collective unconscious and of the accumulated wisdom of humankind. It resonates at the same time, and this is one key to the mystery and one solution to the enigma of elitism with the intensity of our private dreams and nightmares. In one way, great art seems radically disenfranchising, it leaves the individual where God left Job or the poet of the Psalms for dead or worse than dead, a worm, not a human being. But this is, of course, the logic of comparison, not of comprehension. In the first shock of experience, great art strikes us as superhuman and the acknowledgement or rejection of it can make us reach for notions of possession. But we're scarcely the dispossessed in this equation because we partake of the experience. You and I don't know what it was like to be Benini tracing with infinite delicacy, fingers turning into leaves, nor can we imagine matching late Titian. But we experience them in a way that is intensely intimate and it can only take place within the privacy of an individual heart and soul. But the experience is not, in any ordinary sense, personal. 
Oscar Wilde played on this paradox when he said that the death of the hero of Balzac's lost illusions was one of the great sorrows of his life, underlining in the process that art can only be subjectively apprehended, though, of course, um, he was joking about the particulars. What he experienced was what every receptive reader experienced, the exaltation of reading a great novel. Art does not so much stare back at us as stare through us. It can find us wanting, just as it can make us feel whole. Democracy, for heaven's sakes, is there to make the experience of art available potentially for the greatest possible number. The duty of our politicians when it comes to art is not to deny the distinctiveness of art, still less to scapegoat and demonise the artist, confusing as the picture may sometimes get, but to make art available to every member of society, regardless of how well off they are or where they went to school. History is littered with the bonfires of the vanities. Savonarola terrorised Renaissance Florence, and even Botticelli was sympathetic to the witch hunters and image burners for a while. Just as some liberal-minded people, keen to protect the innocence of kids, have found themselves on the side of the Puritans and the prohibitors. It seems to me that it's easy to be muddle-headed about this when it comes to questions of harm, consent and what have you, and to fail to acknowledge that the licence of art, its ability to appear transgressive and radically unreasonable, is part of the cloud of unknowing that comes with the territory. It's part of the wonderment of history that Madame Bovary and James Joyce's Ulysses, like Lolita in the 1950s, Portnoy's complaint in the 1960s, were the subjects of bans. It seems absurd in terms of the moral standards that have emerged, let alone the aesthetic and critical consensus. It's perhaps worth remarking in passing that aesthetic judgment is likely to be ahead of the common garden moralising. This makes sense if you allow that art is a form of truth and that its basis is moral. In any case, society now accepts that T.S. Eliot was right to defend Ulysses and Patrick White was right to defend Portnoy. And just in case we think these battles are won forever, Lolita, for reasons that may seem familiar, is once again under fire, not from the censors but from vigilantes who recently managed to have it withdrawn from over 1,500 retail outlets across this country. Well, there must have been a complaint. It figures, of course. We spend most of our lives in a world where we go at a green light and stop at a red light. Of course we have to live like this. No one seriously denies that this is how we have to function in society. But it's not how the imagination works, and it's not how art works recalling Dostoevsky's The Possessed, that devastating novel about terrorism. Whether in the text or as a postscript at the end, any edition will include Stavrogan's Confession, the scarifying chapter about the sexual abuse of a young girl. The Possessed is conventionally referred to as the greatest political novel ever written, the supreme prophecy of totalitarianism. We would run a mile from Stavrogan in real life, but it's in the nature of art that we let him into our imagination. T.S. Eliot once said, I can only say there we have been, but I cannot say where. There was no, this was no doubt true of the epiphanic experience for quartet's traces, just as it's true of the experience of making art. It's also true of the effect of art on the individual, an effect which, as I say, transcends the red light green light world. One of the great and obvious things about artistic experience is that it abides. Once you've finally got Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, you've got it forever. It will abide for you in a world of jingling and jangling, trash and diversion. We have no easy social measurement for the way we are charged by the experience of art, but we know we are changed utterly. And however poor in spirit, or morally down and out, we know that we are the better for it. In fact, that we are immeasurably richer for it. The particular talismans for any individual will vary, whether it's Mozart and Mahler, Shakespeare and Bach, Visconti and Bergman, Bacon or Rothko, or any and all of these. We go to our graves defining ourselves in terms of the art we know. 
There was once a widespread perception of this, but it seems to be receding, at least as a value that can be publicly invoked, sure of receiving reciprocation from the electorate. Does this represent some sad spectacle of a decline in values as well as a shift in perspective? Have we really, at least as far as we are represented by our politicians, become a nation which has exchanged the bird's eye view for that of the slug? I trust not. It would be appalling if our politicians were really, as they sometimes seem to be, so frightened of the angry foot of every agitating wowser that they are content to slide along the ground, oblivious of the moral imperatives and the high claims of artistic attainment. There can be times when it's hard not to take this dim view. And there are also the pressures, of course, on everyone in everyday society. In a world where market forces have relativised all sorts of accepted aesthetic standards and have relegated the animation of the imagination, the creation and experience of art, to a low spot on the cultural food chain. Everyone knows that this is a falsification of value, that Hollywood action films designed for boys of nine don't compare well with Brando or Bertolucci at the height of their powers, but we're almost embarrassed to say so. In a world where everything tends to be reduced to a pedestrian wasteland of utilitarian contentment, where everyone spends an inordinate amount of time on cultural popcorn, who can blame the politicians if they're content to see art burn? I think we can. Yes, it would require a statesman these days to publicly declare a love of art, and more particularly when the going gets tough. But shouldn't this be a minimum requirement if you believe that the totality of what we mean by art, the literature, the music, the visual arts, is the basis on which society rests, its moral raison d'etre? As a friend of mine said to me recently, without the law, we would have no society, but without art, we'd have no civilization. What a perversion it is when zealots contrive that these two mighty things should be put on a head-on collision course, and how sad that our legislators, the people that are supposed to make society fit for civilization, should allow it to happen. Art is what connects us to history, just as it allows us to feel the ground of our own being, as well as the farthest reach of where the imagination can fly. This is a potentially shared heritage, and what, it, and what makes us who we are, even though we experience different parts of it and uh, do so individually. When I look at a late Titian, I get a sense of an almost anonymous perfection. It's like a force of nature. It brings to mind Homer's words, and the god came down from the mountains like a storm. It's as if the name of the god has become a dynamic force, as if the noun naming the figure has become a verb. When I look at Caspar David Friedrich's Evening Star, the tiny figure runs with outstretched arms, cap in hand across a small grassy hill, the spires of Dresden in the background, and it's as if you can see the entire history of the West hurrying through that western gate. I don't want to be merely artsy about this, to simply monumentalise the great art of the past. We should also hold on to the perception, as in the fragment about the hanging twins at the start, out of which art is made. Recently, when I found myself in that shopping mall and in the midst of the crowd swirling past into the village cinema complex like a black hole, I caught sight of two teenagers embracing on the floor, just two kids caught in an embrace in a cavity beneath the escalator. They were inward looking. They were so intent, so embedded, so uncaring of the world around them. The scene also reminded me of other things, but it, it was like an Eric Fischel painting. Two contemporary kid tourists in Rome, they were playing under a plinth which supported a, sleep, a sleeping hermaphrodite, Roman copy, the painting entitled The Sheer Weight of History. But the poignancy and the beauty of this scene doesn't depend on the echo. It was the continuity, the life that inheres in art and out of which art comes, which was important. We need art if we are to survive as who we are. In order to be civilised human beings, we need to be able to experience art and, if we can, create it. Is this to ask for a special dispensation, a different law for artists so that they can commit their outrages? Not at all. 
It's simply to ask people to realise that the moral integrity of art inheres in the structures and pressures that produce it. In my studio, I have an etching by Piranesi that shows the Arch of Constantine in shadow with the Colosseum behind it. For those who have eyes to see, it has the power of ungainsable moral principle. The beauty and the power of the image animates an apprehension of our own mortality and at the same time, as a consequence, makes us feel more alive. The supreme artistry is there as a fingerprint, an echo of moral integrity. The artistry is extraordinarily rare, but the principle it brings alive is at the heart of everything. As an image, it is true. It contains truths. It recommends truth. This is a making visual of the remembrance of things past. It dramatises with great bareness and clarity the plangency of the recapitulation of the memory that's made new with the power of great elegy. It's a 300-year-old representation of a scene that's 2,000 years old. At the same time, it's absolutely intimate. The proximity of the gestures is absolutely real. The object itself is evidence of the impulse that has brought it into being. This instance, which so powerfully intimates the mortality of life and the immortality of the past, provides its illumination in complex intimations, circling each other like a wagon train. I would have hoped there was a place in this, for this in our polity as long as that we treasure the ruins of the past and feel the exhilaration of the transience in which we partake. Instead, we are greeted with horrors like the devaluing of the VCA, we see a new growth in censoriousness and the impulse to constrict the conditions under which art is produced. Absurd attempts to conflate child welfare and artistic freedom as an issue. The idea that the two could be in some way mutually exclusive is absurd. We have bans on depicting the human body, attempts to ban Pasolini's Salo and Lolita and anything that so much as imagines child abuse. Isn't it clear that this way madness lies? Surely the last thing we should bequeath to the young in the name of child welfare is a regime of pandemic fear.